Hi, my name is Keith Neeforth, and I'm the product owner for Sertara's pharmacometric software, including Trial Simulator, Piranha, and our nonlinear mixed effects modeling engine, NLME, which is available through the Phoenix platform, as well as uh, newly released uh, accessible through the R command line, through a set of R packages and companion Shiny apps that we developed that I'll touch on a bit in, in a couple of minutes. I'm here today with Hannah Jones, uh, Vice President of our PBPK Consulting Services. And um, what we're going to do today is give a brief overview of Sertara software and services, and then drill down a bit into uh, software. And Hannah will finish up with a nice case study using SimSip, which gives a, uh, a good example of the types of impacts that um, you can have through use of our uh, technologies and services. What I'd like to do is start with an overview of Sertara, uh, who we are, what we do. Um, and we can see this summarized on, on the slide we have here. We offer consulting services and software that help our partners uh, make better decisions throughout all phases of drug development. Our results speak for themselves. Um, over 90% of new drug approvals by the FDA including NDAs and BLAs, were supported by our software um, running for the past seven years now. Just to take a look at um, our, our people, uh, Sertara has helped our biotech clients create up to 44 billion in value through out licensing IPOs and acquisitions over the past three years. And this slide gives you a scope of, uh, you know, an idea of the scope and depth of our experience, over 200, regulatory and payer submissions, and this is in the last three years, um, over 1,600 clients and uh, over 850 employees. Uh, and that number uh, continues to grow. Taking a look at our people, uh, this, is, this is where the, the strength of Sertara is in, in our people and in our uh, capability to collaborate. We have over 275 um, uh, scientific consultants, most PhD, PharmD uh, level, uh, 250 regulatory scientists, um, over 100 market access specialists, and also uh, over 50 software developers. Um, and again, it's, it's our capability to bring these people together to provide good development solutions, whether it be on the software, services or consulting side that, that makes Sertara what it is. Taking a look at capabilities now, this is, this is a slide that really represents capabilities more from a services side. And uh, we see it starts with uh, the strategy component. Um, it's, it's not enough to have the tools. Uh, what, what Sertara is, uh, I think our strength is, is our knowledge and experience in terms of how to use those tools, how to plan, and from the consulting services side, you get a sense from this slide, you know, uh, where uh, our expertise lies and it's truly across the development uh, life cycle. Now, what I, what I wanted to do is drill down a bit more into uh, software. And what this slide represents is essentially a landscape of our software products in the context of the drug development uh, pathway. Um, in the discovery preclinical area, we have D360, which is a data analytics and scientific informatics platform that allows interrogation of very, very large data sets in a, in a very fluid and uh, interactive uh, manner. Um, we have SimSip, which Hannah is going to touch on uh, before. SimSip really extends you know, out into phase three, probably beyond. Uh, with the nature of uh, questions it's, it's capable of uh, addressing. We have our base case uh, technologies, which is all about value communication. These are interactive presentations that allow you to interrogate data, change assumptions on the fly and have, uh, have your presentation media immediately updated. Again, very fluid. If you haven't checked out base case, I'd encourage you, uh, you do so. Our health outcomes performance estimator or HOPE, this is where we bring together epidemiological models, cost models, uh, pharmacokinetic dynamic models to uh, predict real world health outcomes. 
stepping down into more of the uh, kind of data analysis type uh, tools. We have, uh, and we've had for a long time, our Phoenix platform uh, with WinOnLin, our NCA analysis uh, engine, um, our in vitro, in vitro in vivo correlation uh, tool within Phoenix, um, and of course, NLME uh, from within Phoenix. And then stepping into our pharmacometric solution, this is where I live, um, our trial simulator product, which allows one to, uh, allows teams to kind of evaluate, um, you know, study design options and predict probability of success for given designs. It's a great way to um, interrogate different clinical trial designs, not just from within the pharmacometrics group, but in consideration of perhaps logistical limitations that are, uh, you know, coming from an operations assessment of protocol viability. Very, very useful tool. Um, and of course, R speaks NLME, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that in, in, in a minute. Our enterprise solutions uh, include uh, our, our replacement for PKS uh, Integral. So this is a 21 CFR 11 compliant uh, cloud-based uh, data warehousing type tool. It's able to handle data in a, in, a, uh, in a software agnostic fashion. So it doesn't matter if you're using SAS, non-MEM, wind on LIN, um, Word, Integral can handle the data. And we're happy to provide uh, demos around that um, if, if, if people are interested. And um, then we get down more into uh, software and services that, that include more of a services component are quantitative systems pharmacology. This is, you know, it's not enough to be able to predict drug presence at a receptor. The QSP work essentially begins to model the biology after the receptor interaction. Um, and, you know, again, it's a, it's, it's an extension of uh, the traditional uh, modeling simulation uh, methodologies, uh, uh, systems, systems biology, I guess is the way we, we present that. Codex uh, is our clinical outcomes database explorer. And our codex bases are essentially assembled from public domain information and allow companies to put their molecule and, and questions around that molecule in context of perhaps competition, what's on the market, similar molecules, and then finally, our regulatory writing uh, capability. Uh, Global Submit is an eCTD uh, uh, submissions technology. And ClinGenuity brings uh, artificial intelligence into uh, document uh, documentation uh, preparation um, for major gains in, in terms of efficiencies. Now, it's a lot to digest on, on a single slide. The way I like to think about this is Teams that work in drug development um, are tasked with uh, uh, addressing questions of viability throughout the development phase. Is, is my compound viable for, for the next step? And teams want to essentially you know, check the box green as you move through development. And I think you know, whether you look uh, you know, anywhere in our software landscape, wherever you happen to work in, in development, um, there's a service or technology that Sertara offers that can probably help you um, address, your, address your questions. So that's Sertara as a whole. What I wanted to do is just step down and, and, and talk a little bit more about R Speaks NLME. Now, R Speaks NLME is a collection of R packages, as I mentioned, and companion R Shiny apps that allow pharmacometric scientists to run models using Sertar's NLME engine from the R command line. So this is totally outside of Phoenix. And uh, R speaks NLME is, you know, essentially it's, it's very easy to use. Um, it utilizes Sertar's PML modeling language for easy transferable PKPD structural models uh, from uh, all the way from Win on Lin uh, through into R. We've based the syntax of R Speaks NLME on Tidyverse, so it should be very familiar for people who, uh, who work in R. And in addition to that, we've built companion Shiny apps at key workflow steps in the pharmacometric uh, workflow process that allow that task to be completed, but also 
um, provide command line code back to the user that can be executed at the R command line if they're trying to learn R. Um, when integrated with Piranha, R Speaks NLME also provides some harmonization um, for organizations around the use of command line tools for this type of work. Uh, run structure, model syntax, um, really is, is, uh, can be harmonized through use of teaming up R Speaks NLME with, with Piranha. We are also working on, um, you know, beyond tools, beyond the uh, core workflow analysis. And in particular, we see the opportunity for transformational changes and efficiency to be made through better reporting capability. And um, be on the lookout for some uh, demos coming up uh, regarding that, that functionality. Um, finally, uh, the nature of our work in drug development, whether you look at drug development teams as a whole or down to the level of the very specific analysis, flexibility is key. Um, we work in a domain of uncertainty. Um, things change. Your, your decisions are only as good as the data that you have today. You get a new piece of data tomorrow and you know, teams don't say, wait a minute, that wasn't supposed to change. Successful teams adapt and they're capable of adapting at a very fine level of granularity. And um, this concept is the nature of drug development. And the reason that we've based R Speaks NLME and enabled this access to the NLME engine through the R command line was to support this reality um, in, in the work that we do. Command line gives you complete flexibility um, to address problems. And we've essentially made it uh, simple for the typical user to, uh, to uh, whoops, I'm not sure what happened there. Typical user to, uh, you know, to learn command line languages, which the learning curve there can be, can be somewhat steep. And I think, um, you know, pharmacologists will really uh, appreciate this plot, but this is what we're, what we're trying to do with the strategy for our Speak Settlement. I think to give you a taste, obviously I can't give a demo of the product today, um, but to give you a taste of uh, the types of Shiny apps that we're building uh, to uh, complement our Speak Settlement, we see here on the left, this is an R Shiny app. You're able to select um, from drop down menus for various model types, number of compartments, uh, absorption type. Um, we uh, first order IV. We are also going to support our distribution model, um, absorption models uh, coming up. And as you make selections in the interface, the code on the right hand side here is instantly up updated. So you're able to make selections in a GUI and actually see how that code translates um, on, on, the, uh, on the command line side. Um, you're also able to generate, again, in this RSLME box, the full set of code that's uh, uh, executable from the, from the R command line. Um, be on the lookout for uh, an R Speaks NLME webinar series. Uh, we have two sessions, one in March and one in May coming up. And if you'd like to learn more about RSNLME, um, you can access our online help. And there's a lot of information in there around how we've built it and, uh, and, and how it works. So I think with that, I will, uh, I will stop and I'll turn it over to Hannah for a case study around the SimSip simulator. So Hannah, over to you. Hi, so thanks Keith for the introduction. So my name is Hannah Jones. Um, I lead the PBPK consultancy group within the SimSIP division of Satara. So as part of this presentation, as Keith indicated, we, want to we wanted to highlight the SimSIP simulator, which is a physiologically based pharmacokinetic simulation tool. So here I'm showing a schematic of the disposition model on the left um, and the absorption model on the right. PVPK models are similar to compartmental models in that they're built up of a number of um, compartments which correspond to different tissues or sub-tissues um, that are linked together by um, blood flow. Each compartment is defined by specific um, species um, 
specific systems parameters, um, which are specific for the population or the species of interest. So things like blood flow, volume, transit times, pHs, um, enzyme abundance and transporter abundance. The key feature really of, of SimSIP is the generation of virtual individuals based on these systems parameters and the correlations that are associated between them. And then the user can incorporate drug specific parameters such as intrinsic clearance from in vitro data, as well as protein binding, there's chem data, solubility and permeability to really look at predicting the absorption, the distribution, clearance of a drug as uh, um, using the model. So really the user takes the systems data together with their specific compound data, and then within SimSIP can predict the PK profile of a, of a drug within human populations and also within preclinical species. And in addition, by incorporating inhibition and induction parameters into the model, you can look to explore how drugs potentially interact with each other. Um, the SimSIP simulator has been developed over a number of years, 20 years, um, by a consortium um, model with a number of large pharma, um, academic institutions, and also regulators. These consortium members routinely use SimSIP on a day-to-day -day basis to support their um, drug discovery and development pipelines. Um, we also provide SimSIP modeling services to um, pharmaceutical companies, either consortium members or or biotech companies in what we call um, technology enabled consultancy, which is using the SimSIP um, software to provide um, consultancy. And we have around um, 20 consultants across the world who are responsible for this. And PBPK modeling can be used um, across um, drug discovery and development. And Keith talked a little bit about this before, but we can use, um, we can use PBPK in, um, in, for, in early discovery to predict human PK. Um, we often um, validate our simulations initially in, in preclinical species, so maybe rat and dog to provide confidence in the model assumptions. We can use PBPK at this stage to explore formulation fixes. So for example, if we're seeing poor absorption in animal species, we might want to look at what's driving um, that poor absorption. So for example, solubility or permeability to help drive um, our pharmaceutical science groups. We might want to look at predicting PK and tox species, et cetera. As we start to get clinical data, we can refine our models and explore um, information around like the clearance mechanism of the compound, um, potential inhibition that the compound might have on other SIPs, et cetera, to look at kind of victim and perpetrator DDI liability. We might be interested in exploring food effects using in vitro solubility data from um, simulated intestinal media. We can predict formulation differences a bit like I talked about preclinically and look at bioequivalence and things like that. So as you move further into development, we then can use the model to predict um, PK in, in different types of populations. So potentially patients versus volunteers, special populations like pediatrics, geriatrics, um, and organ impairment, et cetera. It's really a learn and confirm cycle as you move across the right, you generate more data, um, which increases the confidence in the models and obviously their application. Um, this slide here um, indicates the impact that SimSIP simulator has, uh, has had on a number of novel drugs. So here we've got um, over 200 label claims that have been made based on um, PBPK modeling within the SimSIP simulator. What we mean here is that PBPK modeling has been used in lieu of a clinical study. The value here really is that SimSIP is being used to streamline clinical development programs, reducing or focusing the number of clinical DDI or clinical special population studies that need to be performed and getting drugs to patients faster. So finally, I wanted to take you through an example of where um, SimS the SimSIP simulator has been used um, in lieu of um, clinical DDI studies to illustrate the kind of things that can be done within the SimSIP software. Um, so here, um, I wanted to talk about Voxelator. Um, it's a, a molecule or drug that's been approved for the treatment of um, sickle cell disease. It's tightly bound to um, plasma proteins and has an FU 
plasma of 0 0.002. It partitions extensively into blood cells and, and has a blood to plasma ratio of um, 33 in healthy subjects. It's a low clearance drug with a, a long half-life. Um, we had mass balance data, which indicated that 74% of the molecule is cleared via oxidation, 19% by reduction, and 8% um, via UGT metabolism. And then with in vitro data um, from either chemical inhibition data from human liver microsomes or recombinant phenotyping data from recombinant enzymes, we were able to um, calculate a fraction metabolized by CYP3A4 of 36 to 56%. There was also a small contribution from 2C9 and 2C19. Um, so in sickle cell disease subjects, the albumin levels are lower and also the hematocrit is reduced, which means that there's reduced binding or plasma protein binding in sickle cell disease subjects. So the FU plasma is um, 0 0.003. And because of the reduced hematocrit, blood to plasma ratio is actually only 16 um, in, in um, the disease subjects. Um, so basically, because of this, it means that performing um, DDI studies and healthy volunteers might not necessarily be predictive of what's um, going to happen in patients. And also, because this is a rare disease, it makes it very difficult to do DDI studies in, in, in these patients. So the plan here was to really rely on PBPK modeling um, in lieu of any um, clinical DDI um, studies for this particular program. So we developed a model in healthy volunteers using in vitro um, and clinical data as per the kind of um, guidance from regulators on, um, on, on PBPK modeling. Um, we verified the model in a separate clinical data set um, in healthy volunteers. And then, as I mentioned before, we took into account some of the physiological differences in terms of protein levels and hematocrit. Um, to calculate kind of um, um, patient-specific um, protein binding and blood to plasma ratio data. And we verified um, that model at that stage with um, data from sickle cell disease subjects. And then ultimately we simulated the um, 3A4 victim DDI. So this last slide here just shows the um, the, the DDI, la the, the label for voxelator and, and DDI section of that. So um, we performed simulations with ketoconazole, fluconazole, um, rifampicin and efavirenz. Um, and the modeling indicated that in the presence of ketoconazole, there was an increase in voxelator AUC in patients um, by around 42 to 83%. For fluconazole, we predict a larger um, increase in, in AUC, and that's as a result of the 2C9 and 2C19 um, contribution. Um, and then in the presence of rifampicin and the favorins, <clears throat> we predict a decrease in voxelator AUC <coughs> um, by 77% and 60% respectively. Um, so in the, in the absence of COMEDS, the recommend recommended dose for voxelator is 1.5 grams a day. Um, and as you can see, we made some dosing recommendations in, in patients for when the drug is co-administered with strong 3A4 inhibitors or fluconazole. So we recommended here that the dose get reduced to one gram a day. And then in the presence of strong and moderate inducers, we recommended that there be an increase um, in, in dose um, to 2.5 grams a day. So I think this provides a really nice example and a success story of where PBPK modeling has been used um, in lieu of a trial to impact a label. So thank you very much. Okay, so I'm Hannah Jones and I'm here with Keith Neeforth and we're now about to start our live Q&A session. So I think Keith, you have the first question in from the box that you, you want to ask. Yes. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. It's a question for you, Hannah. In the PBPK case study you show, did you use the model for any other purpose? Um, so in the case study we showed, we also used it um, 
Well, this is the beauty really of building PVPK models. You can use them for lots of different purposes once you have them. So as well as um, using them to simulate um, DDI, we also use the model to simulate pediatric PK for this particular example. Okay, uh, next question we have um, in the PBPK case study you show, what is the reason for the shorter half-life in patients versus volunteers? Um, so for this particular molecule, as I um, said in the um, presentation, protein binding and um, hematocrit were affected by um, in, in patients. And so this led to a, um, a, a change in protein binding and blood to plasma ratio, which affected clearance um, and VSS um, and, and turn affected the half-life. I think there's actually another question at the bottom, Keith, um, that's come in um, several times. Yes, okay, great Maybe talks. Can address that one? <clears throat> sure, uh, the comment, great talks. PVVK has grown in Providence over time, reaching regulatory acceptance. I find that agencies still insist on clinical drug interaction trials despite PVVK models showing model-derived outputs of value. How do we further influence this space with stakeholders? So I think what we've been trying to do kind of within Sitaro is, is publish as, as much as possible the examples that we have where we've had kind of successful um, regulatory interaction. There's been a recent white paper produced by Karen Roland Year that's available on our website. And I think really it's about making sure that when we provide, when we submit um, reports and, and, and PBPK modeling to regulators that we provide as much valid validation and verification as we can and, and qualification of the models. And I think the more we submit, the more they'll see and the more confidence they'll, they'll gain from PK modeling. So maybe, um, Keith, I could just ask you a couple of questions that have come in on the live chat. Um, so one of them is, um, what's the advantage of our speaks NLME um, over non mem or other tools that people might be more routinely used to? Uh, great question. So uh, the way I see the main advantage of our Speak Settle on Me um, is through the way we've built it to meet both individual and organizational needs. Um, from the individual, individual perspective, I touched on the idea that a, um, an analyst can learn a modeling language in Winon Lin, and as they progress through their career, they can go all the way to the command line, uh, the tools of serious modelers, and not have to, um, you know, learn other model syntax. So it removes, you know, quite a steep learning curve. In addition, from the organizational perspective, when RSNLME is used, and you know, I, I don't like the word integrated. What what the concept we have is interoperability without forced integration, and it's always a challenge for organizations to. Um, you know, sustainably manage open source, open text type tools. And the way we built RSNLME, we've integrated with Piranha. It um, has capability to be integrated with Integral, our 21 CFR 11. So it's, it's really more of an elastic scalable environment that can be tailored to the needs of particular individuals and particular organizations. That's, that's the true advantage I see with, with, um, with the strategy that we've, uh, we're moving forward with. Thank you. And you also mentioned that there were going to be some webinars in March and, and May. So when, when will it be available for use? Yeah, so it's available now, today. Um, we, we, we launched it last Monday. Um, I'm actually giving an introduction webinar on March 17th, so this Wednesday. And we have a, uh, a follow-up um, part two of that uh, webinar series in, in May. Um, yeah. Okay, and I think there are a couple of other PBPK questions here as well, Keith. Do you want to? Yeah, I see on to one me? here. In the PBPK case study you show, why was the DDI with fluconazole predicted to be larger than with itraconazole? Um, so voxelator is um, metabolized, but uh, in, in terms of its SIP um, metabolic stability, it's metabolized by SIP3A4, um, 2C9 and 2C19. So 
the studies with itraconazole just look at the inhibition of um, 3A4, whereas despite fluconazole being a weaker inhibitor of 3A4, fluconazole also affects the 2C9 and 2C19 metabolism of voxelator, and that's why we predicted with the model that we would have a larger um, DDI with fluconazole. Okay, uh, next question. In the PBBK case study, you show what physiology differences were accounted for in patients versus volunteers. And so these were really things like um, weight, height, kind of demographic differences, and also the um, differences in, in protein levels in hematocrit that were seen in patients. So for example, um, the hematocrit and protein binding differences ultimately affected the plasma FU that we used within the model and also the um, blood to plasma ratio via the hematocrit. Um, okay. So um, yeah. <laughs> it looks like we're uh, just about out of time. So again, thank you everyone for, uh, for joining us today and I wish you a uh, pleasant rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for your time.